was like something out of a Hollywood heist movie. After midnight on September 4th, 1972, three masked men approached the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Circling around to the side, the men approached a tree in close proximity to the wall on the western side of the museum. One man, clad in utility worker grips on his shoes, scaled the tree and hopped onto the museum's roof. He grabbed a ladder and lowered it down for his two companions to join him. Undetected, the three approached a skylight on the museum's roof that was currently under repair and covered in plastic. They opened the skylight to the sound of no alarm as the repairs had disabled it and threw a 50-foot rope through the opening. Each man shimmied down the rope and landed lightly on the museum floor, ready to begin looting priceless jewelry, figurines, and paintings. It would become known as the Skylight Caper, and despite being the largest art heist in Canada's history, estimated in today's values at upward of $20 million, and also the largest Canadian property theft, it remains, to this day, officially unsolved. Hi, and welcome back to my channel. My name is Jamie Lee, and I am a mixed media artist. Here on my channel, I do time-lapse painting videos, light box videos, and weird art videos where I talk about the weird side of art, like haunted paintings, strange tales from art history, and art and true crime. If any of that is up your alley, I would love it if you'd consider subscribing to my channel. You can also turn on the bell icon to be notified when I post new content. And if you've done so in the past, you might want to check and make sure you're still set to be notified because I've been told some subscribers aren't getting my notifications. So thanks YouTube for keeping us on our toes. Without making this intro too long, I do have someone I'd like you to meet before we get started. You may have watched some of my other videos that have been crashed by my French Bulldog, Stella. Well, you'll be happy to know that Stella has very little time to crash my videos because my new little sidekick is keeping her on her toes. This is the Duke. He is a black brindle French Bulldog. He's five months old. He is the cutest and sweetest puppy. Look at that face. He's so chill and relaxed and he just loves to cuddle. So a warning about Frenchies, just like Lay's potato chips, bet you can't have just one. Without further ado, let's get straight to today's video where we will be discussing Canada's biggest unsolved art heist, the Skylight Caper. Montreal Museum of Fine Arts Michelle and Renata Hornstein Pavilion, built in 1913. It's located on Sherbrooke Street in Montreal, in an area known as the Golden Square Mile, traditionally home to the most successful and wealthy families in Canada, many who were of British descent and English speaking. In the beginning, this helped the museum grow and flourish, as the museum could count on its patrons to help fund its mission. However, over time, as things changed in the city, the museum it found itself floundering. Thanks to a growing rift between Montreal French and English-speaking residents, and talk of Quebec separating from Canada, things in the city became unsettled. There were terrorist attacks, and martial law was even declared in the city in 1970. So these wealthy English-speaking people they didn't have to stick around for all this upheaval. They could go wherever they wanted, and they did. Unfortunately, that meant they took their money with them. Even though the museum eventually started to get new French patrons, they just weren't as wealthy, and the museum donations only covered about 40% of their operating budget. This is what led up to the museum's status in 1972, the year the robbery took place. The MMFA was forced to go from a private institution to a semi-public, non-profit organization. In addition to their money troubles, the museum was badly in need of repairs and renovation. Remember, the pavilion had been built in 1913, nearly 60 years before, and it was just outdated. If the museum wanted to snag new donors and appeal to the public, they had to look the part. So it was decided they would close in the near future for an extensive repair project. 
There were a few other things happening at the time that are important to mention here, as it affects what happens after the robbery occurs. First, the weekend of the heist was Labor Day weekend. Many of the museum's important staff members were away on holiday either in the States or Mexico. The board president, the museum director, and the director of security were gone, leaving the museum's public relations director in charge. Second, during the weekend of Labor Day, several other big events took place and ended up severely overshadowing the robbery in the public's eye, possibly adding to the difficulties the authorities would have in solving the case. On Friday, September 1st, a group of men who were refused entry to a downtown bar because they were too drunk deliberately set fire to the steps of the bar, causing a blaze that ended up killing 37 people and injuring many more the deadliest fire in the city in 45 years, and heavily reported on in the ensuing days. Then the Canadian hockey team lost to the Soviet team, a huge blow to the city, as they considered themselves a shoe-in for the win. I mean, Canada is hockey, so this was definitely demoralizing and much talked about. Then on September 5th, just after the robbery, at the Munich Summer Olympics, Palestinian terrorists took 11 Israeli athletes hostage and then killed them along with a police officer. And these events gripped the attention of the world. Canada in particular, since Montreal was set to host the next Olympic Games. All of these big news events pushed the robbery to the side almost immediately. Did the thieves know or care that the publicity of the crime would be limited, maybe paving the way for them to get away with it? We won't ever know for sure. What we do know is that when the three men landed on the floor of the museum, after descending that 50-foot rope, they had a plan, and they seemed to know which items they were set to steal. They had to work quickly, though. It is estimated that one and a half hours had passed from the time they arrived at the museum until they descended the rope. The thieves set off to start grabbing their targeted artwork, but at around 1.30 a.m. they hit their first snag. It was at this hour that one of the three guards on duty headed to the kitchen to make himself a cup of tea. He came face to face with three men in ski masks, one of whom then fired a pump action shotgun into the ceiling and made the guard lie down on the floor when he didn't move fast enough for the thief. As the other two guards hurried to respond to the shots, they too were overtaken by the thieves and all three guards were brought into a lecture hall, Arthur Lismer Hall, where they were bound and gagged. One of the thieves stood guard over the museum guards, while the other two men went to get paintings, figurines, and jewelry, and brought all the loot to the museum's shipping department. Once they had assembled all the artwork, they hit snag number two. It seems they originally planned to leave by the same way they arrived, the rope and the skylight. But after they determined that trying to scale the rope with the artwork in tow would be too difficult and time consuming, they came up with a new escape plan. One of the guards happened to have a set of keys to the museum's panel truck. So the thieves took his keys and decided to leave that way. That didn't work out exactly as they'd hoped. They opened a side entrance door to get to the truck, causing an alarm to go off. This spooked them and they literally grabbed what they could carry of the loot, leaving a significant number of pieces behind and fled on foot down Sherbrooke Street into the darkness of the early morning hours. One of the guards managed to finally untie himself from his bonds at around 3 a.m., an hour after the end of the robbery. He called the museum official in charge, Bill Banty, the PR director, who told him to call the police. The police soon arrived along with Banty. Altogether, they determined that 18 paintings and 38 other pieces were stolen. The total estimated value of the loot was $2 million in 1972 value, with one painting alone, a Rembrandt, being valued at more than a million dollars by itself. So what made up this two million dollars, now twenty million dollars, of stolen art, various priceless jewels, and small figurines? This painting by the school of Jan Brugel, the Elder, originally thought to be a Brugel, but more on that later. This one's called Landscape with Vehicles and Cattle. This painting, which is actually by Jan Brugel, the Elder, Landscape with Buildings and Wagon. The Dreamer at the Fountain, and Young Woman Leaning on Her Left Arm, both by Jean-Baptiste Camille Corot. This Gustave Courbet landscape, which is called Landscape with Rocks and Stream. This Honoré Damier called Head. 
<laughs> a Ferdinand Victor Eugene Delacroix painting titled Lioness and Lion in a Cave. A Narcisse Virgil de la Pena painting called The Sorceress. Thomas Gainsborough portrait of Brigadier General Sir Thomas Fletcher, this painting right here. Jan David Stahim, two paintings, Still Life Veritas and Still Life with a Fish. Jan Francois Millet, two paintings, Young Woman Churning and Portrait de Madame Millet. This painting by Giovanni Battista Piazzetta, Portrait of a Man, possibly a self-portrait. Rembrandt Van Rijn, Landscape with Cottages. Peter Paul Rubens, Head of a Young Man. And these two paintings by Francois Andre Vincent, Portrait of a Lady and Portrait of a Man. The very morning after the robbery, Bill Banty held a press conference. He described all of the stolen works plus how the robbery had occurred, which was rare for a museum robbery since many don't like to publicize all the stolen work. According to a blog written by Catherine Schofield Sesgin called Unsolved 72 Theft of Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, quote, Normally there's no way these people could get into the building, Bill Banty told the Montreal Gazette in 1972. The skylight is hooked up to the alarm, and the only entrance is the side door where you have to be recognized to enter. But we have been doing repairs on the skylight. It's not as good as it used to be. And so the alarm system was only partially functioning. If they had tried to come through a different section of the skylight, the alarm would have gone off. A construction crew working at the building had dropped a plastic sheet over the alarm, neutralizing it. Banty wrote in the Gazette in 2007. It appeared that the intruders knew beforehand that the skylight was not secured." Unquote. The thieves actually left behind work that was just as valuable as the works that they had taken, including a second Rembrandt, plus paintings by El Greco, Picasso, and Tintoretto. The robbery was front page news across Canada and the United States, but the story faded quickly, with the Summer Olympics tragedy overshadowing the theft in the news media on September 5th. Guards were unable to give much of a description of the thieves to authorities. According to police reports, quote, they said they saw two long-haired men about five feet six inches tall and wearing ski hoods and sports clothes. One spoke French, the other English, but they heard another French voice of a man they never saw." Unquote. Police were struck by how similar the assailants sounded to ones who had just committed another art robbery on August 30th. And that theft, three thieves, broke into the summer house of Agnes Meldrum in Oka, 20 miles from Montreal. They arrived at that robbery in a similar spectacular fashion as to the MMFA robbery. In this one, they climbed a cliff from a boat on Lake of Two Mountains and stole $50,000 worth of paintings. Eventually, authorities decided that the two robberies were actually not related. Let's take a look at some of the initial theories as to who could have pulled off this heist. One of the first theories police pursued was that the theft was an inside job. How did the thieves know the skylight was under repair? How did they know the alarm wouldn't go off? How did they know they could just open the skylight and not smash it? The thieves were also very careful to leave no evidence behind. The police photographed the crime scene at the museum. No fingerprints were found, no weapons were found, and there is no mention of what kind of bullet the thief shot into the ceiling with his shotgun. I didn't find any mention of that after the initial description of the crime. So mm -hmm. they investigated the skylight workers and the possibility that the thieves had spied on the skylight workers. The idea that the workers had been watched came from a report that quote, a couple of weeks before the theft, two guys with sunglasses and cigarettes sat on chairs on the roof opposite the museum, sitting and watching, claiming they worked at the museum. Elaine LeCourtier said, Elaine, we'll talk about him later, but he is a very integral part of this case in later years. Continuing the quote, 
but after the theft, no one could find the chairs. The theory of it being an inside job was dismissed because no evidence supported it. Also against the inside job theory was the thieves seeming panic at the end of the robbery. If they had inside info, they would have known that the side entrance was alarmed and also that the alarm only sounded within the museum. It is well known that art thieves usually aren't the masterminds behind an art theft. The thieves themselves are usually hired or roped into the scheme by a higher up or the mastermind themselves to do the dirty work. And often, crazy as it sounds, art usually isn't stolen to sell because it can't be sold. Everyone knows it's stolen, so everyone is on the lookout for it. Art is often taken as a bargaining chip or a tool and will often pass through many hands in the mafia world, in drug rings, or in weapons rings. Many times stolen art will end up in the private collection of a wealthy collector who either doesn't know it's stolen or has no intentions of the wrong people seeing it. So one theory is that the person or organization behind the skylight caper knew what art they wanted to steal and had picked the art out beforehand with the intentions of eventually selling it to certain people or bargaining with certain people using that art. So how did they know what to pick out beforehand? Well, half of the stolen pieces were part of a traveling exhibit called Masterpieces from Montreal that had shown around the US for a while. Plus the Rembrandt and many of the French paintings were in an exhibit that had received a lot of outside press attention. So there was a good possibility that thieves had been tracking the paintings and were in possession of the handbooks or catalogs listing the exhibition's paintings. The Ecole de Beaux-Arts de Montreal was near the museum. Great, right? Makes sense. But a group of Beaux-Arts students and the museum had been at odds for a while. A particular group of about five students visited the museum often, but were often asked to leave the museum early so the staff could take tea. This museum sure did love its tea. This pissed the students off. The police wondered if this group of students could have been angry enough to plan and commit art theft. They were placed under night and day surveillance for 15 days after the robbery. However, this tale turned up no evidence of the students' involvement at the time. One of the students from the school does turn up later on, so stay tuned for that. Now we get to the ransom saga. Two times the thieves tried to seek ransom payments for the return of the artwork. Even though one of the paintings was recovered in this manner, the entire ransom plotline was, well, it's just a mess. A week after the theft, museum director David Giles Carter got a phone call. The man on the other end had a, quote, nasal voice and spoke with a European accent, according to Carter. And this caller directed Carter to a phone booth located near McGill University, about a mile and a half from the museum. Carter sent his security director to the location. And once there, he answered a phone call telling him to pick up a discarded cigarette pack from the ground nearby. Inside was one of the pendants stolen in the museum theft. On October 26th, the museum received a brown manila envelope with a Port of Montreal stamp on it. The Port of Montreal is famously associated with the West End Gang, which is basically a local crime organization. Inside was a snapshot of all of the stolen artworks together. The ransom the thieves were demanding was originally $500,000, but they later reduced the amount to $250,000. I don't, I don't know why. Carter wanted more proof that whoever was contacting him still had the paintings before he forked over any cash. So the alleged thieves sent Carter to Montreal Central Station, Gare Centrale, and told him to look inside a particular locker. There he found the alleged Bruegel painting. Despite more efforts soon after this to recover more paintings, this remains the only painting to be recovered. I say alleged Bruegel because once the museum got the painting back, it was relegated to the basement for 10 years while waiting for a suitable frame to be purchased. And then, even though it was eventually rehung in the museum, it was now thought that it wasn't actually painted by Bruegel the Elder, as originally believed, but by a member of his school. Many old masters had schools of painters who either copied their work or painted parts of their paintings. And so a work attributed to a certain painter could often have been painted by a student of that painter instead. Of course, 
this makes the painting sort of worthless. And this leads to the question, did the thieves find out the painting was quote, fake? Is that why only this painting was returned? It does seem strange that only this painting came back and it turned out to be not a Bruegel. What happened next was a bit of a wild goose chase. The museum and the museum's insurance companies, together with the police, set up a sting operation. An undercover detective posing as an insurance adjuster set up a meeting with the thieves. It was to be held strangely enough, in an empty field in one of Montreal's suburbs. It was hoped that the thieves would hand over one more painting for the $5,000 the insurance adjuster was supposedly bringing. But this scheme fell apart when an unrelated policeman, unaware that a sting operation was happening, drove by the area and the thieves feared a setup and didn't show up. They, the thieves, told Carter as much the next day, but the consensus after was that the thieves had actually set up the museum and the police, not the other way around. And it was thought that they did so to create a diversion while they tried to sell or get rid of the stolen paintings. The next year, 1973, a museum board member received a phone call. The person on the line said that he would tell the location of the paintings for $10,000. The museum's insurance adjuster, Andre Decoy, said they would be willing to pay for information, but wouldn't pay for the paintings themselves. Once the money was secured, Decoy set off to get this coveted info. Unfortunately, what he set off on was another, more convoluted, wild goose chase. He was instructed to go to a phone booth in downtown Montreal. Remember those days? They seem to have a lot of phone booths in this story. <laughs> they wouldn't be able to do this today, would they? Anyway, once he got to the phone booth, he was sent to the racetrack and then to the metro station, and etc, etc. But then he was instructed to return to his office because the caller sensed a police tale. Once back at his office, he was again directed to a phone booth, and then another, and then another. Eleven in all, until 4 a.m. the next morning. Then, finally, he was told to leave the envelope with the $10,000 at the base of a sign in a vacant lot, and then return to the first phone booth and await a phone call. Nothing about this sounds sketchy, does it? Like, seriously, he just left the money on the ground and then went back to... Anyway, the caller never called. So Decoy returned to his office, where a call came in later that morning, directing him to go to a motel north of Montreal, in Laval, where the paintings were said to be. Despite a thorough search of the motel by the authorities, no paintings were located and no $10,000 was recovered either. After this third failed attempt at a ransom, the museum quit pursuing ransom demands, which was easy since there were no more anyway. In 1973, Bill Banty was frustrated with the ongoing lack of coverage the theft had received. In fact, they had received no coverage whatsoever. After the initial brief international coverage, the theft had not been mentioned at all in media outlets. So Bill put together a circular featuring the descriptions and sizes of all the stolen paintings in English and in French to be distributed internationally throughout the art world. The hope was that the paintings would become so widely recognized, no auction house or collector would accidentally purchase them. It was the first time really that a museum had so publicly featured a collection of stolen art. However, it didn't lead to the recovery of the paintings or even any viable leads. It was said by museum officials, authorities, and the handful of people that reported on or were involved in the investigation of the Skylight Caper that a complete and total lack of evidence in the case made it nearly impossible to solve. Once the initial contacts with the alleged thieves had ended, there was no surveillance back then. There were no fingerprints, physical evidence, useful eyewitness accounts, or even obvious suspects. There wasn't even a clear motive. Why steal the paintings? <laughs> Why leave half of them behind? Who was the mastermind and what was he or she hoping to accomplish with the paintings? A ransom, a black market sale, a private collection sale, 
a bargaining chip, the insurance companies had paid out the claim on the theft to the museum, which the museum then used to purchase a Peter Paul Rubens painting, which later turned out to not be a Peter Paul Rubens painting, but a student painting. Again, the insurance companies posted a $100,000 reward for information leading to the recovery of the stolen art. Since the companies had paid on the claim, technically the paintings, if recovered, would belong to the insurance companies and not the museum. The museum would actually have to buy them back if the paintings were recovered, and yet because of the value of the stolen paintings, the museum couldn't actually afford to buy them back anyway. However, despite the upped value as the years progressed, approaching $20 million total, and a hefty reward for the information on the theft, it remains unsolved to this day. Despite what little there is to go on, there are some theories as to who might have taken the paintings and why. For years, various organizations were tossed around as possibilities. The Mafia, such as the Montreal's West End Gang, one of the oldest organized crime groups in Canada. But there is no evidence tying them to the crime. There is the possibility that the original organizer of the crime passed the paintings to members of organized crime in other countries, such as Italy or possibly a country in Latin America. And then we return to one of the first theories that we looked at, the students at the Beaux Arts School in Montreal. While the initial group that had been placed under police surveillance was ruled out, a new possibility emerged thanks to a new person taking a look at the case starting in the 1990s. Alain Le Corsier. Remember I mentioned him before? Well now here's where he takes over. He was an art theft specialist with the Montreal police who had earned the nickname La Colombe d'Art or the Colombo of Art. Remember that guy, Colombo? Yeah, well, this is the art Colombo, you know, cute. Well, he began looking at the cold case just because he was curious and he was known as an art theft expert. So this really piqued his interest. He was hoping to find something new that would lead to, if not a full recovery, at least a new lead to pursue. And he did find something, although what he found is still questionable. In 1998, La Corserie was introduced to a man known only as Smith through a dealer that he knew. Smith had been a student at the Beaux Arts School at the time of the theft. He was well aware of the ongoing tensions at the time between the students and the tea drinking museum staff who repeatedly closed the museum early so they could have afternoon tea and ask the students to leave. In addition to this, La Corserie found, Smith seemed to know a great deal more, including details about the crime that had never been reported to the public. For example, Smith knew that the rope the thieves used to enter the museum was yellow, not gray like reports had stated. A detail La Corserie learned when he mentioned to Smith the steel rope, and Smith corrected him saying, no, no, it was nylon. Le Corsier grew more suspicious of Smith the more he talked to him. He discovered that Smith bought a house and a woodworking business one year after graduating university for almost one million dollars, but Le Corsier could not figure out how he would have acquired so much money. Smith pawned it off as he came from a wealthy family, but Le Corsier wasn't really buying that explanation. Smith wouldn't disclose where he got such a large sum of money, but according to Le Corsier, he did say that he would tell him more about the robbery in the future. Some years later, while taking part in a documentary on his career as an art theft specialist, Le Corsier visited Smith at home and offered him a two million dollar check on camera if he would lead him to the paintings, but Smith just laughed. However, as a final weird communication with Le Corsier, in 2011, Smith sent Le Corsier, then retired, an email with a video link in it. The link was to a Hong Kong commercial for Mercedes-Benz. In the clip, bank robbers steal a briefcase from a bank vault, then escape in a Mercedes. They are not captured, but leave the briefcase behind. Inside is a long-lost stolen Da Vinci painting. Weird. It's been almost 50 years since the Skylight Caper. Despite everything, it seems this case is no closer to being solved than it was in 1972. Over time, what little evidence was gathered disappeared or deteriorated. According to Le Corsier, when he first picked up the 20-year-old file in 1993, quote, it was missing a lot of pieces. 
he said, two declarations had vanished. Tips were investigated but improperly filed. Information had been trashed as a result. At some point, everything left in the dossier was transferred to microfilm. The last time Le Corsier viewed the film, it was in poor shape. Very bad quality, he said. Probably now, we can't see anything. So the hope of getting real answers has all but faded. The two men who seem to know the most about the crime, Alain Le Corsier and Bill Banty, who passed away in 2010, have different theories as to how the paintings got to where they might be today. According to La Corsier, it is possible the paintings may have been destroyed to prevent them from being used as evidence against those in possession of them, but he believes it is more likely they were sold through smaller dealers who may not have known they were stolen, or who didn't care if they were, to collectors who likewise keep them private, especially today since they can't sell them. As to who was behind the heist, La Corsier speculated in an article for Canadian Art titled The Skylight Caper, quote, probably the West End Gang or the Italian Mafia hired the West End Gang. Some organization, that is his best guess. The artwork gets sent to the Colombians or the Russians, he said. They exchange cocaine, they exchange arms for a quarter of the value of the painting. A 10 million Picasso, La Corsier speculates, might be worth 2.5 million in drugs. So where does that leave Montreal's missing paintings? According to Le Corsier, they're likely in Mexico or Central America, or maybe South America, unquote. Banty, strangely enough, also believed the paintings were in South America, somewhere having said, quote, I've heard several people I respect say that, unquote. The police investigation into the case, although cold, is still officially open. So what do you think about the skylight caper? Do the paintings still exist? If so, where do you think they ended up? Do you think Smith is a little suspicious? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Please give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it, and subscribe to my channel and ring the bell if you would like. Either way, I'm so glad you hung out with me today while we took a look at another fascinating unsolved art heist. If you want to keep the art theft train going, and you're interested in the world's largest art heist, go ahead and check out my two-parter on the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum heist, linked above. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and I'll be back with another art video very soon. Bye! Approached a tree in close proximity to... I mean... Ah! You have someone I'd like you... So these wealthy English peeps, peeps, <laughs> they arrived at that robbery in a similarly, similarly, <laughs> they arrived at that robbery in a similarly, sim why do I write stuff I can't say? <laughs> okay, let's try this again. I don't even know if I can say this. Portrait of Brigadier. Then return to the first phone booth. <laughs> no, I think I said it wrong. Sure, I did say it wrong. Of course, here. Has disappeared or deteriorated.